afternoon. My name is Bella Florental, and I'm a co-chair of the Technology Across the Curriculum Committee, which is co-sponsoring this event with IRT. I would like to introduce and the library. And the li sorry. And the library. Thank you. And the library. I would like to introduce our guest speaker, Brandon Butler, and provide some background about him. Brandon Butler is the practitioner in residence at the Glushko Samuelson Intellectual Property Clinic at the Washington College of Law at American University in Washington, DC. At the clinic, Professor Butler supervises students or attorneys who represent clients in a variety of IP matters. Before teaching law, Butler was the director of pu uh, public policy initiatives at the Association of Research Libraries, in short, ARL. While there, he worked on many issues ranging from fair use to network neutrality to the Patriot Act. He is a co-facilitator with Peter Yatsi and Patricia Ofderheit of the ARL Code of Best Practices in Fair Use for Academic and Research Libraries released in January 2012. Before coming to ARL, Butler was an associate in the Media and Information Technologies uh, Practice Group at the Washington DC law firm Dow Loans. He received his JD from the University of Virginia School of Law. Please welcome Professor Brandon Butler to the podium. Thank you very much. Hello, thanks you guys, thanks for that introduction. Um, so today I want to talk to you a little bit about fair use in education um, and, and why you should know your rights and then maybe a little bit of what those rights might be. Uh, as you can see here, I've been supporting radical militant librarians in my career for the last uh, several years and, uh, and part of my plea is to ask you to also support your own radical militant librarians. So what's the, what's the roadmap for the talk? I'm going to say three basic things. Uh, first, I'm going to talk about, oops, first I'm going to talk about copyright, fair use, and progress. And then I'm going to talk about the best practices approach, which is, to my mind, uh, the best and frankly the most honest way of making sense of fair use for folks on the ground who need it. Uh, and then finally, I'll give a little bit of an update since I, I've come from Washington and I'm here to help. I want to give a little bit of an update on what's happening in Washington and in the courts around this issue of fair use because you know, this, is, this is hot stuff that's developing as we speak. So the first thing I'm going to talk about is the purpose of copyright. Now, the purpose of copyright is actually not something that's terribly mysterious. It's, it's summarized. It's, it's, it's declared expressly in the Constitution. Uh, the Constitution gives Congress the power to make copyright law for a very specific purpose. And this is actually quite interesting because other powers that Congress has, Congress can do whatever it wants with them, generally speaking. But the copyright power is actually uh, ought to be or is, is intended to be, and it's clearly by its language intended to be, limited to uses for only this purpose, which if you don't read, uh, if you don't read um, ancient script very well, the purpose is to promote the progress of science, which, funnily enough, the word science now means culture. Uh, in, in, in the way they use the word science to mean what we today call culture, right? That is, you know, the exchange of ideas um, and, the prog and, and the progress of culture. So promoting the progress of culture. Now, copyright serves that purpose in two ways. Right? The way we all know, and that is most intuitive, is that copyright gives copyright holders a limited monopoly. Right? And if you ask someone what is copyright, that's likely the first thing that comes to mind. It's this right that belongs to artists or you know, generally the person who they give it away to or sell it to. Right? And that's what copyright is. It's a limited monopoly. But if you actually look at the statute, copyright works in other ways. 
it also operates to encourage new makers to use existing culture, right? The Copyright Act gives authors a monopoly, but then a huge amount of the Copyright Act is actually devoted to then delineating, limiting, carving out exceptions, and balancing out that monopoly with, uh, with, with a, a series of rights that, um, that are meant to empower other folks, uh, the next generation of rights holders and the next generation of makers and the next generation of learners, all the people who participate in culture. So that first thing, the limited monopoly, right? If you look in the Copyright Act, what you'll find is there's one provision, section 106, that describes a bundle of very specific rights. Right? The copyright holder doesn't have absolute control over anything and everything you might ever want to do with your books. Right? It is only certain things that you might want to do that copyright covers. It covers reproduction, covers distribution, creation of derivative works, you know, a movie from a book, um, and it covers the public performance or display of movies, images, and so forth. Right? Um, these, these rights are actually finite. It may not seem so. Uh, but they are meant to expire, and back in the golden times, uh, they f expired actually quite rapidly. So the founder's copyright expired after 14 years. Uh, and you could renew it for another 14 if you wanted to, and very few people did. Uh, then it became 28, renewable for 28 more. And again, there was a study done by the Copyright Office of renewals uh, in the 19, uh, well, of renewals that were made or not made in a period around the 1940s to the 1960s. And what they found was less than 10% of rights holders renewed for that second half of their term. So 28 years seemed to be just about all most people wanted. And if you give them the option of, of saying, well, if you want more, all you have to do is write a letter to the Copyright Office that says, I want more. Most people, the vast, vast majority, didn't. But for a number of reasons that I won't get into, that term has gotten longer and longer and longer, and now it's the life of the author plus 70 years. Um, but that's still not forever, right? And sooner or later, everything is meant to rise into the public domain where we can all uh, use it however we want. The limited monopoly is also limited in subject matter, right? So the copyright holder has a right to control their expression, but not the underlying ideas, right? So Shakespeare can, can, you know, could stop you from uh, giving a, doing a reprint of Romeo and Juliet, but he can't stop you from writing a new play about star-crossed lovers, right? So the big, broad ideas that are, that are communicated in copyrighted works belong to all of us from the very beginning, and copyright protection only attaches to the specific expression of ideas. And then there's a panoply of special limitations and exceptions if you're a church, if you're a teacher, if you're a library, if you're, you know, if you're a shipbuilder. I mean, there are these all kinds of interesting exceptions that, that Congress has basically said, we like these guys, we want them to do what they do, and we don't want copyright to get in the way, and so we're going to throw them a bone. And so sections 108 to 122 are these specialized exceptions that's, that, that are sort of special dispensations for um, favored communities. And that's the part that's encouraging new makers, right? So we have a public domain that is not covered by copyright. Government works are not covered by copyright. Anything written by anybody on the federal payroll is in the public domain from the minute it's written down. And of course, ideas are completely free. Favored uses get specific exceptions. But what I want to talk to you today about is fair use. Fair use is by far and away the biggest balancing feature in the Copyright, uh, it, it, in the copyright Act. It is, it is the oldest, right? Um, by, by most accounts, fair use has coexisted with copyright all along, right? Since the Statute of Anne in 1700, uh, fair use has been this kind of balancing feature that says, you know, sometimes, even if it looks at first like the author ought to be able to control this, upon a closer look, no, right? Upon a closer look, this is a fair use, and we want to let it happen. So fair use is the legal unauthorized use of copyright material under some circumstances, right? It's about taking that closer look. Why and when do you decide that some uses should be fair? Courts have, over time, considered four key factors in deciding whether use is fair. And so in 1976, you know, over 130 years since, these factors came into circulation in the courts, Congress decided to put them in the law. So if you go right now to the Copyright Act, Section 107, 
is the fair use provision. And the, and the majority of Section 107 is this language that tells courts, these are the four factors to think about when you're deciding whether a use is fair. Think about <clears throat> the purpose and character of the use. Why is the user, the alleged infringer, doing what they're doing? Are they just doing it to make a buck? Are they doing it in pursuit of truth and justice in the American way, right? What kind of work was used? Uh, was the work that you took a news report? Was it a scholarly article? Was it a blockbuster film? You know, judges will weigh that as they think about whether what you did was fair. How much did you take? And I want to pause for a minute. People get obsessed with this factor, and empirical analysis shows you know, over and over again, two, three, four different exhaustive, um, exhaustive looks at the history of fair use show that amount is, has very little explanatory power as to whether a judge is going to say what you did is fair. And in many, many cases, and I can name them if you'd like, judges have said, you can use the whole thing. If your purpose is the right kind of purpose, right? That's really the thing that, that judges have come to emphasize. So amount used, often fetishized. Effect on the market, also often extremely overemphasized. But this idea that, you know, if the rights holder is losing a buck, then that's a bad thing and copyright won't tolerate it, right? And there's an obvious problem with being too concerned with markets because literally every fair user is someone who could pay but doesn't want to, right? They're in court if they've been sued and, and what they're asking the judge for is the right to do this without payment or permission. And so if the rights holder can negate that and say, no, it can't be fair because I'm here and I want money, well, then nothing is ever fair, right? And so again, the, the idea that market harm is the end all be all um, is demonstrably false has been, you know, judges do not operate that way. And for the, for the reasons I just described, they couldn't, right? Fair use would simply cease to exist. Now, in my view, for reasons I won't bore you with, um, the four factors are not very helpful. They, and, and I, I think this should be fairly intuitive. I mean, if I, if I end the talk there and say, all right, now you know what fair use is, um, I don't think you'll be satisfied with this talk, right? You have these four things, you go out into the world, you gather up information about your purpose and about this and about that, and then what do you do with it, right? How do you know how to make sense of it? And in fact, for a while, especially after fair use was uh, codified in the law in 1976, you know, before it was a common law thing, judges did it using their inherent power as judges to make exceptions when they wanted to. But then after 1976, it became written law. And, and for some reason, there was a kind of proliferation of bad theories of fair use after that. Right? And so people thought, well, it must be all about amount, or it must be all about the money. And even courts fell for this kind of stuff. And so there's some really bad decisions from the late 70s and early 80s that, and, and people still today will point to some of these decisions and say, fair use is just the right to hire a lawyer. You know, this is, it's unreliable. Judges don't know what they're talking about. Look at this crummy decision. Those crummy decisions, the good news of this slide is, those crummy decisions are in the past. Judges over the last two decades, since the early 90s, have really come to love balancing features generally and especially fair use. They have seen that the, the rights embodied in Section 106, the length of those rights, the power to enforce those rights, so the penalties have become extraordinarily draconian, right, $150,000 statutory damages. Judges are increasingly encountering cases where it seems like this, this case should not be in front of me. And they are taking advantage of fair use as a way to get rid of crummy copyright infringement cases. And so judges have come to really embrace fair use and to deploy it more and more to excuse socially beneficial uses. The Supreme Court has said twice now that fair use is a First Amendment doctrine, right? It is required by the First Amendment. And it's not hard to imagine why they would say that, right? Copyright is a government granted power to stop someone from speaking, right? If I am a copyright holder and uh, you, for example, are, are, a, um, are a political candidate that I disagree with and you use my song in an ad in a way that comments on the campaign and, and so on and so forth, right? I can just literally take that ad off the air by suing you based on copyright, right? And if there were not some cases when that freedom of speech to use the song could overcome the copyright monopoly, then there would be a First Amendment issue, 
right? If the copyright monopoly was an absolute power to always shut down speech, there would be a very serious First Amendment issue. And so the Supreme Court has said no. There must be a safety valve. The First Amendment requires it, and fair use is it. And then finally, and most importantly, uh, judicial interpretation around fair use has shifted dramatically in the last uh, couple of decades, since 1990. And so I want to talk a little bit about that. This is the dominant paradigm now in fair use. Judges ask two things. Is your use transformative? Right? And this, is, this is a concept that has become extraordinarily powerful that I'm going to talk about more, in more detail. Is your use a use for a new purpose, in a new context? Right? Adding a new message or meaning before a new audience, right? um, using the work to generate new insights. You know, those are productive uses, uses that the courts have said we want to encourage and we won't let copyright discourage. And then if the answer to that question is yes, your use is transformative, then courts ask simply, did you take the right amount given what your purpose is? So if, you're, if your purpose is to comment on a, on, a, on, a, on a film that you've seen and explain why you thought it was bad, do you need to post the entire film on your website, right? Uh, probably not. Um, and so courts generally use this kind of, it's a kind of litmus test. In my mind, I think of it as a kind of litmus test of, of honesty. That is, if you tell me a transformative story, oh, I'm doing this for all this new purposes, and I've got a great reason, and I'm really a critic, and I'm not a, I'm not a thief, then, what, then you need to take the right amount for the purposes you describe. And if you don't, then I have a pretty good reason to doubt um, that you're doing what you say you're doing. So I want to give some examples. This is an example of taking existing copyrighted work and placing it in a new context. So the shoe you see on the left, that's an advertisement for a high-end shoe. I can't remember if it was Gucci or Chanel, but uh, a very high-end, high-fashion, luxury shoe. But it's an advertisement, right? The photographer took a picture of this woman's foot and sold it to the shoe company, and then they put it in a magazine. And then uh, a few years later, along comes the artist Jeff Koons. And you can see the piece of work on the right, which, you know, the message is so obvious, I won't belabor the point in explaining it. I think, you know, there's feet, there's food, um, something's going on there that's very deep. But anyway, whatever he's up to, whatever he's doing, it's not selling shoes, right? He has taken a piece of commercial advertising and he's put it in the context of high art, right? And this is also, you know, for what it's worth, it's an enormous sort of wall-sized mural that hangs in a fancy bank lobby in New York somewhere. It looks nothing like an advertisement. It is, in, it is a radically different context. It has a radically different message. So yeah, it's the same feet, but the feet have been used transformatively. That, this case was litigated, Coons won. Another example of a transformative use that is for a new purpose that doesn't involve art, but in fact involves the kinds of things I think that, that you guys are maybe more familiar with, which is the creation of a research tool, right? A search engine for images returns search results that are images, right? And so uh, Google image search, in order to exist, it must copy many, many times, right? First, it has to ingest the image into its database. And then it proliferates that image throughout the database, compares it to other images, you know, creates an algorithm so you can find the image. And then when you do a search, it shows you a little thumbnail of the image to help you see whether it's the one you want. Right? All of that is obviously radically different from what any particular photographer was doing with any particular photograph. Right? So the purpose of Google's image search is to help you find images. That's a, that's a new and extremely socially beneficial purpose. And again, this case has been litigated. Google and many other search engines were sued by many you know, uh, angry rights holders. And, they, and, and they've won and won and won to the point now where it's just a, a truism that search engines are fair use. Uh, you can also do a parody, right? a new message. Same, same song, but new message. And in the case of parody, the message is generally, this song is stupid, right? <laughs> Whoever made it is, is silly. Um, and so here you have, again, a case that was litigated. Uh, the, the, the video on the left, uh, I, don't know, I don't know if I can say the title of it in mixed company, but um, uh, I can? OK, what, what in the butt uh, is the title of the video. And it's this sort of really goofy, cheesy, campy, 
you know, sort of dance song. Um, hard to tell how seriously he took himself, but then must have been pretty seriously because uh, South Park on the right there made fun of the guy and he sued them for infringing because even though South Park sort of made its own video, it is recognizably a version of the original, right? That's, it has to be in order to work, right? You, you need to recognize that it's a version of the original or you don't get the joke. And so they made fun of virality and internet stuff and this particular stupid video and the case got tossed in a heartbeat. This principle of transformativeness and of useful new messaging uh, in fair use has become so strong that South Park won attorney's fees from this guy. And the judge said essentially, why are you here? Don't you know that this is at the core of fair use? So fair use has really, really uh, grown wings. And, and I think this case is a nice example of how powerful fair use has become. Now there's a second thing that's really, really important to know about fair use, which is Judges are talking about transformativeness. They're applying it in all these different ways that I've described. Judges also, uh, a, a scholar named Michael Madison did a sort of exhaustive study, again, of the sort of 200 and some odd fair use cases that we've had in the US uh, since you know, the turn of the century, um, and found that another thing judges do is that they care about practice communities' norms, right? And so as a way to know whether a use is fair, judges want to know, is it, is it normal and legitimate in the eyes of the community that's engaging in this kind of use? Um, it's, a kind of, uh, it's a kind of proxy, right, for socially beneficial, right? If, if we think that librarians are good and libraries are useful, and all librarians agree that to pay a license for a particular use would undermine the fundamental mission of libraries, and they're all getting together, and they're all doing the same thing, and they're all making the same kind of use, courts take notice of that kind of thing, right? And so, uh, especially, again, when you can document that practice, when you can cite something and say, this is the norm of our community, right? We've put it in, we've put it in various documents um, that issue from the authoritative bodies that we are all members of, and so forth. So, Best practices codes operationalize that insight, right? So Mike Madison wrote his article in early 2000s, and within a couple of years, my colleagues Peter Yazi and Pat Alfterheide started doing uh, what you'd call community organizing in a way, talking to practice communities and trying to surface the norms about what is fair, right? And so. Communities now, uh, it's, the, the numbers are, are, are through the roof and growing. There are more than a dozen now communities who have gone through this practice of sort of convening under the umbrella of authoritative membership groups, you know, like ARL, ALA, you know, who, who is the leading professional organization in the field, then convening groups to deliberate about what's legitimate, to think about your values, to apply these broad concepts of transformativeness, new purpose, new message. How does what we do you know, um, add value to culture? And when is it, given our values and, the, and our place in the kind of ecosystem of culture and copyright, when is it appropriate for us to do stuff without asking? Right? Fundamental question. So many, many communities now have engaged in this process. You've got communication scholars, Pat After Heidi's friends, because she's a communication scholar. You've got poets and poetry scholars, which that's a really cool code if you want to get into that, because talk about appropriating, right? And then you've got dance collections and dance archives, um, open courseware, which, was, which is really cool. There's a lot of neat stories to tell there. You know, MIT had, had uh, spearheaded this movement to take, uh, to take curricula and, and even lectures and stuff and make them available online sort of before MOOCs, right? These are kind of the proto-MOOC. The very first efforts toward doing this were really kind of crummy because they were afraid to, to put any content in there, right? Like if I'm talking about Robert Frost and I'm talking about a picture of Robert, this is sort of the paradigm case and there's a video that, that um, the folks at MIT can show you, I don't have it, um, of a lecturer saying, now take a look at this photo, you know, who's this guy? And, and, and it turns out it is Robert Frost when he was younger and it's really 
a compelling part of the of the lecture about Robert Frost, the meaning of Robert Frost, but they didn't show the damn photo, and the kids didn't get it, right? And if you're watching it online, it doesn't make any sense. And so after they did a best practices that said, you know, look, of course, of course I can show the photo, I have to. And to find and track down all the people who took these photos would be impossible. And this isn't why the photos were taken and so on. And they told a very good story about transformativeness, and now they're doing it, right? And they're succeeding with it. And academic and research libraries is the community that I know the best. And we embarked on a sort of three-year project to develop one of these codes. All the codes are online. Uh, the Center for Media and Social Impact is Pat Alfterheide's uh, center at AU, and they've collected everything. So anything that you're curious about, if you want to just survey the lay of the land, um, all of these codes are at cmsimpact.org. And they're all sort of interesting. They interconnect. They cross-brace one another. You know, they're consistent and coherent, which is funny because you know, all of these groups do this themselves. You know, we sort of show up and run a, we run a focus group, but what comes out has to come out of the community. And, and they're, they're sort of consistent and coherent, which is really nice. The Documentary Filmmakers Code was the first one. And, and I want to tell a, sort of the good news story about that code because it's, it's had the longest time to sort of have an effect. And it's had the most dramatic effect over time. After issuing the, their code of best practices, so let me talk about the before. Before issuing their code of best practices, documentary filmmakers were systematically avoiding certain subjects. Right? So when Pat and Peter went to them and did this kind of uh, interview process, you know, what are you doing? How, do you, how does copyright affect what you do? You know, this, this community had not really you know, thought about whether and how they could take advantage of fair use. And so they were doing these really unreflective things. And, and they really didn't have any idea why they were doing them. And so they would talk to Pat and Peter and say, well, no, nah, copyright's not really a problem because I just don't make movies about recent pop culture. <laughs> you know, <laughs> Or like, I just, I just don't make movies about Disney or that might include Disney. Or I just don't make movies about J.D. Salinger or whatever. And so, there were just these ginormous holes in the documentary subject matter that folks were willing to tackle. And they didn't even perceive it as a problem until they said it out loud to one another. And then it was like a consciousness raising exercise, right? Wait, what? what? That's, that is a problem. And so then they got together. They had meetings together. They talked about, well, OK, so let's start from zero. We're clearly not living up to our mission. This is not our values. So what should we be doing instead? They declared this code, very simple, easy to follow, you know, a handful of principles that tell you what are the things that we all agree are legit. And within a few months, filmmakers started getting green lights for new films. And TV stations who, you know, who had previously been afraid to air films where the filmmaker said, I don't have permission, but suddenly they would listen to the rest of that sentence, right? Because you could say, I don't have permission, but Everyone in my community says I don't need it, right? No filmmaker thinks it's reasonable to try and get permission in this case. And so you're going to have to let me go forward. New kinds of films got made. You know, there were films, there's a film called This Film Is Not Yet Rated, all about the MPAA rating system. Nothing in that was paid for. No licenses for anything, for obvious reasons, right? The MPAA probably not inclined to let you do, to let you make that movie, because it's all about how crummy the rating system is. Um, and they paid no royalties. And, and the filmmaker actually was praying to get sued, because this is like the best possible. You know, he was hoping. And, he, and after it came out in the theaters, he, was, he told Pat, uh, after Heidi, you know, if they won't, I wish they would just sue me before the DVD comes out. You know, I mean, they don't have to sue me while it's in the theaters. But they'd sue it, then I could put in extras about it on the DVD. We could have like an inlay with the complaint. And nothing happened. Nothing happened. These films got made, and these people did not get sued. Um, lawyers have started using the statement, and my clinic uses this statement, and lots of clinics around the country use the filmmaker's statement to help documentary filmmakers plan and deploy how they're going to use fair use in their films and to get insured. This is sort of the most important thing. I, don't, I, I, I'm, I'm, I want to move quickly to the next thing, so I'll just say filmmakers need insurance uh, because there are so many rights involved in making a film. So every film has to be insured just in case you screwed up and somebody didn't sign something, right? Before I did this, I had to sign something that said, you can, you can tape me, I'll never sue you. There's 100 reasons I could sue you, and I promise I will not exercise any of those reasons. Um, and I'm a lawyer, so you really got to watch out. Um, 
and every filmmaker needs insurance because there are thousands of people who are similarly situated who have rights involved in a film. And so before this code came out, those insurers wouldn't get within a mile of a fair use claim. They wanted to see documentation of permission for every clip. And after the code came out, within months and certainly within a year, all of the insurers were competing on price. I'll insure fair use for 50 bucks. I'll insure it for 20 until it came to zero. So now everyone insures fair use with no additional cost. You know, they're not marking it up. And that tells you something about risk, right? Because insurers, it's their job to price risk. If they thought out of every 100 fair uses, 10 are going to get it wrong, they would charge everybody enough to cover the cost of defending those 10, right? And they must be, right, they must believe, and accurately so, by all I, uh, by all I know, that they're never going to have to defend anybody because they're not charging anything. So I want to talk about your rights, right? Know your rights. This is, these, this is the, these are the things you should know, right? And this is all from the librarian's code, and I, I want to urge you to read that, right, and get the details because this is just very broad strokes. Um, uh, but, but I want you to get a sense of how compelling this stuff is. So one of the rights that, that is declared in the Code of Best Practices for, for Libraries is the right to support teaching with access to materials on electronic platforms, right? So things like electronic course reserves. The right to digitize archives and special collections, right? Those things are moldering in boxes. They're hard to get to. They're hard to find. They're hard to identify. Digitization is a hugely important thing, and we heard a, long, a, a strong, clear message that that's got to go forward under fair use. You can preserve fragile and outdated materials, right? Things like your VHS collection that is, you know, probably more or less, you know, the smart thing to do if you don't have fair use would probably be to turn all of those tapes into paperweights, right? Like there's really no use for them. Um, well, you can digitize them, assuming you can't buy the DVD, right? And then why would you? If you can buy the DVD, it's a, it's a heck of a lot simpler and better to buy the DVD. Um, to facilitate non-consumptive research, that's a mouthful, but it means basically text mining, right? The kind of cool stuff that digital humanities folks are doing now where, you know, they want to tell you, they, they can write a paper and tell you things like, you know, when did we stop saying the United States are and start saying the United States is? And you can crawl over millions and millions of books to find out the prevalence of those kinds of usages. And you know, well, what do you know, right? The X, the X in those curves is the Civil War. Right? right after the Civil War, is takes off and R goes through the basement, right? So that's really cool stuff, and that's fair use. Uh, you can collect and preserve the web, right? We're hearing from lots of folks who want to grab things because things on the web are ephemeral, right? The, the, the author can take them down whenever they want. And who is going to curate that stuff? Who is going to create collections of that stuff? How will people do research on that stuff? Well, fair use is an answer, at least part of an answer. You can mount exhibits online and in person. So you have a fantastic special collection or a really comprehensive collection in a particular area. And you want to showcase highlights. And you want to tell a story about why you have that collection and so forth. Fair use allows you to publicly display uh, works on the, on the web and in person, which again, that's one of, the user, that's one of the, those exclusive rights, right? So if you're going to put a poster up in a public place, a copyright holder could come and, and complain about that. So you need fair use to be able to say, no, no, I get to do this. Robust support for institutional repositories. We heard a lot of folks say, I hear from grad students who abandon projects because they are afraid to include the research they did, which involves other people's intellectual property, right? Whether it's a chart, a graph, an image, a film, right? Now we have digital uh, theses and dissertations, and so you've got people who want to include footage, like media footage, news footage, film clips, and so forth. And uh, students have said, you know, I think if I have to put things in the repository, and if you tell me that nothing can go in the repository without an explicit list of permissions, just like those insurers used to say about the documentary films, then I won't write that. This I won't write that thesis, and so the librarian said, you know, look, it's got to be, it's it's got to be an urgent part of our mission to ensure that people writing theses and dissertations understand their fair use rights and are allowed to deploy them. So 
So there should be no policies that, that hinder fair use in dissertations. And then finally, ensure equitable and, and not, last and not at all least, uh, ensure equitable access for disabled persons, right? And especially when we've got now increasingly access to huge digitized corpuses like the Hadi Trust Corpus, you know, the more those kinds of things come online, the more possible, the more it becomes possible to accommodate folks who need to access information in different modalities, right? But to, to convert formats and to distribute converted formats, again, is a, is, a, is a reproduction and a distribution. So you need fair use to cover that. And because, of course, it is vital uh, that libraries do provide equitable access, the community has announced, right, that no, this is something we have to be able to do under fair use. Crucially, right, all of these sort of declarations of rights, all of these principles are subject to a series of limitations. Each principle has its own series of limitations. And those limitations describe sort of the important requirements and outer limits of a consensus, right? So it is certainly not the case that any old sharing that you can call educational on the internet is fair use, right? So there are details, there's fine print, and the fine print is in the limitations. For example, in the context of e-reserves, what we heard over and over again was access has got to be limited to students enrolled in the class. You can't put this stuff out there for everyone in a department or everyone in the school, it's much less everyone in the web. You know, if the purpose is for this class, then access should be limited to this class. Access should end at the end of the class. You know, those kinds of things which seem intuitive, but are very important to stay within the bounds of what's normal. And then there are enhancements, right? And this was something that actually previous communities didn't do this. They sort of stopped it good enough, but you know, of course, librarians are, are Johnny good guy. And so they had a series of things that they wanted to be sure to express that were doing better and doing more than the bare minimum. And so there are, for each of these principles, a handful of things you can do that you, know, you don't have to do in the, but if you want to do them, if you can afford to do them, so there's also sensitivity here to different people with different resources, different libraries. So if you can afford to do them and you don't mind and it makes sense and so on and so forth, enhancements are things that you can do to further strengthen your fair use case. So best practices are not guidelines. And, and you guys have been living with guidelines in the education world for a long time. And, you know, you can't be blamed for that. This, guidelines were the industry standard way of dealing with fair use, right? As I said, after the 70s, things were pretty confusing and pretty confused. And so fair use was widely understood uh, by lay folks as having mostly to do with money and uh, markets and amount. Even though no judge has ever uh, decided cases only on that basis, um, that was the way people wanted to think about fair use. And so you get these guidelines that say 1,000 words is fair, 1,001 is not. You know, 30 seconds is fair, 45 is not. All of this is completely out of, out of step now with the way the courts think. Um, courts are no longer counting words if they ever did. I don't think they ever did. They're no longer asking, you know, is there a guy with his hand out demanding money? Now the guy with his hand out demanding money sometimes ends up paying the attorney's fees, right, for the other guy. So things have changed and all the guidelines need to go out the window. Best practices are different because they give you principles that describe broad practices that are legitimate, not these kinds of narrow, arbitrary, numerical rules. They give you limitations on consensus, right? They tell you, well, this is what the majority of your community thinks all of us should be doing. But again, there's no pretense that these limitations are absolute bans. And so in, in your circumstance, you are still free, and there's nothing in these documents that tells you otherwise, to follow your own circumstances and to do what is right in your case. And so there's no pretense, as there was in the old guidelines world, that what we've said is now the gold standard forever. And if you do anything else, you're a, a thief. And the guideline, I mean, the, uh, the best practices are about reasoning and not rote. It takes, a, it takes some work to make sense of the best practices and to apply them. You've, you've got to gather the right information and you've got to think about things. You know, there's, there are fuzzy kind of words in there like appropriate and reasonable. You know, we're not going to tell you a thousand words and so what are we going to tell you? Well, you have to be reasonable, you have to be appropriate, you have to be sensitive to the context. Why are you doing this? And so it's going to take some deliberation on your part to make sense of this, but it's worth it. 
And the last thing about best practices is that the goal of best practices is to get you to try this at home. You really should do this. You should deploy these things and try to wrestle with these questions, and you will succeed uh, with the best practices in your hands, rather than back off and say, you know, just give me a piece of paper with numbers on it, or you know, I just want the council to tell me what's right. Best practices are an invitation to do it yourself. And that's scary, but it's worth it. There's some other things you can, so, so some core purposes that best practices serve. They're a new input for risk management, right? So every decision is in the face of uncertainty, right? When you build a building, people might slip and fall, right? If it's a two-story building, there's going to have to be stairs. And if there are stairs, people might slip and fall. And those people might sue you. And there's nothing you can do to stop that, right? So there's a non-zero risk that you will get sued every time you decide to build a building. And yet buildings keep getting built because of mission. Right? It is worth it. It is worth it to take the risk that somebody might be unhappy. It is worth it because what we're doing in these buildings is important. And we, by God, we need more than one floor. Right? And the best practices are meant to bring in that perspective of what is worth it. When is it worth it to act in the face of uncertainty? And then also, frankly, how can you reduce that uncertainty until it is a reasonable, uh, manageable uncertainty? But but there's stuff in all of these codes that is about mission. Why is this important? Why should you do this? Why should you take a little bit of a chance? It's a reasonable chance, but you should take it, and here's why. It's also about considering the views of librarians or of any given practice community who, frankly, often they find themselves in a situation where a gatekeeper is making decisions for them, right? Whether it's your general counsel or you know, somebody, it's, it's, it's whoever is out there who is reading your proposal and deciding do you get to do what you want to do, right? There are a lot of those people. And sometimes those people make decisions about what you get to do that are ve very ill-informed in terms of why you want to do it. You know, no matter your best effort at describing your project, someone will come to the project and they will say, yeah, 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 when I was in law school in 1968, I learned fair use is about 1,000 words or less, and this is 2,000 words, so no, right? And so this is a kind of document that lets you educate the people who can tell you no with the facts that they need to understand your mission and understand why they should tell you yes. And it's a grounding for solidarity. So librarians are, to a certain extent, in the same position that documentary filmmakers, insofar as there were a lot of folks doing things that they didn't think was that great. Right? We, there were a lot of people we spoke to who said, this is best practices, not now practices, right? Because my, my current practice is really not the best. And I don't want you to just take a poll and then tell me what most people are doing. Because whatever that is, that's not what we should all be doing right now. We need to all go back to the drawing board, think about our mission, and, 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 and come out with a unified statement of what's right. And so that's what these uh, best practices are meant to be. They are a kind of reference for frontline staff in many ways, right? They don't replace, they don't give you the kind of granularity that you get of a thousand words and, and no more, but they do give you things like, you know, password protection, when, what kinds of things are you thinking about when you're thinking about whether something is appropriate or reasonable, right? So again, it's, it empowers people to make decisions without making decisions for them, but that's better than nothing, right? And, and, and if, you're, if your line staff were either you know, totally out of the loop and told, you know, thousand, count words and, and stop. Um, or else it was anarchy, right, which is more prevalent than you might know. Um, this is a nice middle ground, right? You're not telling people, you're not giving people arbitrary rules that sacrifice mission, but you're giving them some guidance, right? Um, finally, the, 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 the code is, all of these codes are sources of rhetoric and arguments, frankly. Right? When you're writing your proposal that goes up to whoever tells you yes or no, you can, and I give you my express permission and it's on tape, steal our rhetoric. Right? Why is this fair? There are arguments in the codes that tell you why a particular use is fair, why it's valuable. Um, so steal that stuff. The front matter is about fair use. It gives you the state of the law today. If you've got a lawyer, again, most, most campus counsel, and it's absolutely not their fault, they have to do a thousand things, right? And most of it is not copyright. And so why on earth would they be on the cutting edge of what copyright means and what those rules are? And so the front matter is a nice, you know, concise summary of the state of the law. And it can get people up to speed. 
Um, each of the intro paragraphs, again, sort of makes the case for why things are fair. And there's a lot of supporting materials online. So if you go to arl.org slash fair use, or if you go to that CMS impact site, there are FAQs, there are blog posts, there are stories about people that are using these things. There's lots of great stuff. So let me real quick talk about the courts, and then I want to answer your question. So courts have weighed in now, actually, on, on four out of the eight principles, believe it or not, in the librarian's code. Not explicitly, to my great disappointment. So we've put the code in the record um, in a couple of these cases, uh, not in the, well, did we, we didn't have time to get it on the record in the Georgia State case, but we got it in the record in Hadi Trust, and we got it in the record in Google Books. You know, and, and the court didn't take up our invitation to specifically cite us, but it sure seemed to be stealing from us. Um, because in both of those cases, what you have is more or less a ratification of the same thinking that is in the code. So in the Georgia State case, the court says, you know, gives, it directs the libraries to do all the stuff that Principle 1 directs them to do. It says, well, you've got to, you've got to use a password-protected site, you've got to limit it to students, um, and so forth and so on, right? You shouldn't be using probably things that are written expressly for a class like textbooks. That's a different thing. Um, so there's a lot of stuff in the Georgia State case that although is, it is not a kind of word for word recap of what's in the code, it parallels quite nicely. Similarly in the Hadi Trust and Google Books cases, you know, so Georgia State case was about e-reserves. The Hadi Trust and Google Books cases are about massive digitization of books and then the subsequent uses that are appropriate. And in those cases, especially in the Hadi Trust case, what you get is a ratification of three principles in the code. Because what Hadi Trust is doing is they are preserving books, right? Putting them on redundant servers. If there's ever, you know, if there is a nuclear holocaust, those books are underground on a server that will be around. Um, so it's about preservation, it's about non-consumptive uses, right? Those text mining uses. And it's about access for the print disabled. Those are the three things that were litigated. Those are the three uses that Hadi Trust is making. Those are the things that Authors Guild said, you've got to pay us to do that. And in, in each of those cases, the judge said, this is a core transformative purpose, a core fair use. Um, I can't think of a better example of a fair use than this. And get out of my courtroom, Authors Guild. So, Big, big win for the code in my view. So what's next for those cases? Well, unfortunately, right, those cases are on appeal. Those were district court decisions. Both cases are now up at the appellate court level. Um, oral arguments have been heard, and we're waiting for, well, oral arguments were heard in Georgia State. We're waiting for an opinion. Oral arguments in Google are coming up later uh, in April. And Hati, I don't think, has scheduled oral arguments. but. We're waiting, right? And the appellate court could turn everything around. And so it's, it's a stay tuned moment. Um, but I'm feeling, I'm feeling good. Legislation. Copyright is moving, moving on the Hill. Uh, and, and yet nothing is moving, moving on the Hill. So you get the illusion that copyright is important and that it might get reformed and, and that, that everyone is worried about it. Um, but, I'll, but I'm here to tell you the likelihood of anything happening anytime soon is like zero. Um, but they're talking about it. And it's an interesting and fun conversation, frankly, to watch. If you get into this stuff, if you read the code and you think, oh, this is cool, there are hearings. You know, Peter Yazzie was recently an expert witness at a hearing in the House Judiciary Committee about fair use. And they're talking about the future of fair use. So things are happening. Um, things are happening on the Hill. It's, as I say, it'll be a long time before that turns into anything that, that will matter. Um, but it's fun to watch. And finally, I guess I'll just say a very quick word about MOOCs. MOOCs, to my mind, are kind of the cutting edge, right? And, and they're the hot new thing. And I want to say a word of, of caution and slash inspiration about MOOCs, which is um, use it or lose it. MOOCs are this kind of novel teaching and learning context. And I think there's a real temptation to say, well, now we need licenses, even though we'd never had them before, right? Now we need permission, even though we never had them before. Now I want somebody to just give me all the learning materials rather than me putting together the learning materials that I think are best. It's easier that way. Um, I think that's a real temptation, and I just want to urge you to assert your rights clearly and early. Because these things, again, for the same reasons, right? once a bad practice becomes really well established and people are paying and people are getting paid, it's very hard to unwind that norm, right? For the same reasons that it's 
that it's um, that it's powerful to declare what you believe. It is disempowering to find yourself entangled in these licensing scenarios that ultimately you might regret. Music sampling is a cautionary tale here. There were some bad cases around sampling and hip hop music, and now basically all sampling is licensed, and it's really warped the way that music is made, right? And changed the way people can make their art. But it's too late. It's like too late. Nobody litigated the fair use issue very well, and now they've given up. So that is the book that all of this stuff comes from. It's called Reclaiming Fair Use. Pat and Peter sort of put together everything they've learned in doing these community organizing projects. There's literally like a how-to section so you can write your own code for any community that you're a part of. And it recapitulates in great detail the stuff that I've just hinted at here in terms of the power of fair use and transformativeness. So I recommend it to you. This whole slide set is CC BY. That means I, I want you to do whatever you want with it as long as you put my name on whatever happens so that people can find me if they want to use it again or do whatever. Um, and you can exert it, even if I had not done that, of course, you can, you can use this in a transformative way under fair use. And that's me. And I'll leave that up there if you want to write down stuff. And I, I'll have a few minutes here for questions. So thank you. <coughs> yes? Um, when you were talking about the documentary code for filmmakers, documentary mm -hmm. filmmakers, um, am I to understand that that's a policy that industry folks have agreed upon, or it's law? It's not a government policy, right? Oh, yeah. No, it's not law. None of these are law. OK, so when you kept talking about the code just now, you mean it's a term of art. It's just it's 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 sort of the genre. These things are written as codes. Okay. So they 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 have a structure to them, a broad principle, limitations, and so forth. But that doesn't they have no legal effect. And I should be very clear. I mean, they have the kind of legal effect I explained, which is judges might find them persuasive, and they should because they typically have found these kinds of values persuasive. But we're not passing any laws here. What we're doing is getting communities to sort of no, declare I think themselves. Were clear. I just wanted okay. to confirm that that's what you, you were talking about. But but then who then created this code? Was it the CMS or was it documentarians? Like what? That's a great. That's an important point to be clear about. So, what CMS does, what Peter, Pat, I, and other folks who've done these codes, we're kind of like again. I guess community organizers is a word. I mean. What we do is we sort of go out like social scientists or anthropologists into a practice community. Mm -hmm. And there's a three-phase process. First, we sort of do these interviews. I think of them as like a diagnostic interview, right? What are you doing right now? You know, how do you encounter copyright in your practice? What do you do when you encounter it? You know, are you happy about that? What are, the, what are the things that keep you up at night? What are the problems that you might want this kind of process to solve? Um, and then there's usually a written report that comes out of that. And that report becomes you know, secondary once a code comes out, because the code is meant to sort of solve the problems in the report. But all these reports are out there. And so you can sort of see the status quo ante. What were people doing before the codes came out? And so there's a report that kind of says, look, it turns out documentarians are missing the boat. They're not doing all of the, all of the, the agitation they could be doing. They're missing opportunities to make cool movies. Then there's a kind of organizing process which involves deliberation in small groups. I call them focus groups because I grew up in a crass commercial era. Uh, Peter Yazzie calls them you know, small, quiet meetings because um, he's a nice you know, 60s Quaker kind of guy. But uh, whatever you want to call them, it's eight to 10 people from the community. And what we do is we present them with hypothetical scenarios that mirror the stuff we heard in phase one. So you encounter this problem, what do you do? And they deliberate together. And, and all we do in terms of adding content to that discussion is, is explain the transformativeness concept and explain why what you're doing here matters and maybe how to think about your mission in a way that, that is going to make sense to a lawyer. But then it's up to the, the communities to talk about mission, to talk about their norms and values, and how they would solve these problems. Um, and so then we derive a kind of consensus from all of these meetings. There's usually eight or 10 meetings um, all over the country. We try and get a diverse you know, group of people involved. Then, and, and again, I, it's, it's, I'm really glad you asked this question because the process is important. We, Peter and I and, and, and Pat or whoever else is involved, we, we congeal that consensus into a series of principles that expresses what we heard in the groups. 
we'll go back to some of the folks in the groups and, you know, is, does this look like what you told me, right? And then, then we take that to a team of lawyers. So there are five copyright experts. They change every time. So, some people have been along for the ride and done several of these codes, but it's always diverse experts, private practice, from academia, um, nonprofit folks, but they're all copyright, noted copyright experts, and they read through the code and say, you know, in my expert opinion, is this a reasonable articulation of fair use? And so nothing goes out the door with that imprimatur, and the folks put their name on the book, so they have to stand by what they said. Um, and so each, each code has a team that reviews it, and then it comes out. But again, the, who is writing the code? Your organization, in other words, who's empowered to write code? Well, oh, that's, a, that's, a, that's that, an interesting, so, well, who is empowered is, is great, but I've got so many questions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Really no, this is important. The so, process is great, but I, I actually want the end result answers <laughs> right now since we have such limited time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's like who well, that's a part of the process, yeah. right? So, I mean, so who is empowered to, and who is empowered to write a code is, um, generally speaking, the best, the strongest adoption of codes has come when the leading membership organizations from a That's community sponsor. So in other words, it wasn't necessarily the Director's Guild or the Writer's Guild as far as filmmakers, no. but it, it was, was it the CMS for the documentary, um, the documentary code or? or? There, I forget the names of the groups, there, but their names are right on the front of the thing. Okay, so I'll go, and it's, they're all available at cmsimpact.org? Yes. Oh, okay, cool. So and then in other words, you would refer to saying that, you know, if you were in a certain community like the librarians or like filmmakers, you'd say, Oh, well, the so-and-so. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Right. So the code for librarians, I often shorthand say it's the ARL code, okay. right? It's the code that, you know, was the Mellon money was managed by ARL, mm -hmm. ARL paid me, and ARL and ALA and ACRL were the initial endorsers of the code. Like the, the day it came out, it had their names on it. And they're the people who help us identify who goes into these groups, these focus groups, right? So I, I was just on the phone with ALA and ACRL saying, well, who are the folks in your membership that I could talk to? And so that's how we decide sort of who gets, who gets to make a code with us. Anyone can make a code. As I say, there's, there's the book process is, can be applied by anyone anywhere. But I think, right, for obvious reasons, it's more compelling when it comes from well, the authoritative. Exactly, it, yeah. it gives that credibility to come from the authoritative membership. Well, world. I have a hypothetical as yeah. a filmmaker. If I'm shooting in the subway and I see the logos of New York City Mass Transit, um, I would. I don't know if it sounds like from what you're saying. For two reasons, it's okay. One, because it's a documentary. But two, did I understand you to say that anything produced by the government is by the federal government. Oh, so in other so words, So some New York state City. governments keep their copyrights. Um, you know the big one and the big, you know, mm -hmm, the, mm -hmm. they're very iconic, iconic images. Yeah. So is that allowed? And is it only allowed in a documentary? But if it were a feature narrative with Julia Roberts, it, you'd have to pay for it. You know what I'm saying? Yes. Um, I am, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not your lawyer, but I'm 99% sure, right, that it would be just fine in a documentary. Um, there's a principle that's explicitly about, right, and it gets much worse than subway signs, right? What happens if you're, and this happens a lot, right? You're interviewing the subject of your film, you know, in his truck, and there's ambient country music on, right? Well, what do you do with that music? It's incidental. It's background. It's part of the setting. You didn't plan it per se, right? And so if you were thinking, you know what would really set the mood here is if we could play some Taylor Swift. Could you put that on the radio? <laughs> that crosses a line, right? And that's a funny thing. I, as a lawyer, would have had no idea that that matters, but the documentarians know, yeah. right? Like that's not, so, if I did that, that makes me feel icky. That makes me feel like I should probably pay somebody because I picked their music and I'm setting a mood. Mm -hmm. Right? I'm not capturing it as part of a documentation. I'm using it, and they should get paid for that. So this is, I mean, it's really neat, right? You discover this stuff, and the com it has to come out of the community. As I say, Peter and Pat and I don't, we don't know that stuff. We come to you guys. Well, I have lots of questions, but I want to give the floor to someone else, too, if they're interested. Otherwise, I guess. I see a hand in the, in the way back. If you if you find those images on Google that are that are really great and you have to share with your students and you put it on your PowerPoint slides and you put it under a PowerPoint protected site, you know, a password protected site, 
Now, you don't know what your students are going to do with that. I mean, you could put a saying into there, you should not distribute this or whatever. I would. Um, so first of all, you should put a saying saying that your students, that this is copyright protected material. Now, are you, as a professor, allowed to put that image in your PowerPoint slide that could have been created by who knows who? So there are a few different answers to that. Um, the, the main answer is, all, is it depends. Because um, I'm a lawyer and I have to say that. I get a nickel every time I say it. Um, but the, th there's one nice, quick, sure answer, which is whatever you do in your classroom, physical classroom, if you're, if you're showing that PowerPoint in your classroom, you're golden. There's a specific exception, so you don't have to worry about fair use. There's one of those specific exceptions for teaching that just says you can make any display or performance you like in your classroom, no questions asked. And what gets tricky, right, is when you want to put it on the web. Um, or, but, you know, not on the open web, for God's sake, but, you know, behind a password-protected site or whatever. Um, then there's some interesting stuff going on. One is I, I would very strongly advise that you put a kind of legend on there that says this is for educational use, I'm sharing it with you for that purpose. Um, and the reason you would do that is it is actually, it's very, very hard for you to be responsible for things other people do in the law, right? And, and this, is, this is the case in copyright as well. So, right, if, if somebody comes along, if somebody steals my car and then uses it to run someone over, not my fault, right? As long as I took reasonable precautions to keep them from stealing my car. If I left sort of the engine running and the lights on and I wrote, steal this and kill on the window, then I'm in trouble. But a normal person doing normal things, not likely to be liable for what bad people down the line do. And that's also the case in copyright. To be in, to, for you to get in trouble because your student says, ooh, I like that picture, I'm going to put it on a t-shirt and sell them, it is very difficult for me to imagine, even if you didn't put the little warning. I, the, the little warning that says educational use only is a belt and suspenders thing. It's proof that you're a Johnny Good Guy, that you want to do the right thing. And it, it also is educational to your students, right? It tells them, you know, basically, you should think twice before you do stuff with this stuff. I'm giving it to you for a reason, and you should be thoughtful about what you do with it. And I'm not going to tell you what to do with it other than what I'm telling you to do with it, which is to use it for this class, right? What else you do with it is your business, but you should think about that. Right. It has to be on every slide? Oh, God, no. No, no, no. Just in your website? Yeah, I, I would say even just something, you know, something, some way to put students on notice that the things they get in the context of the class are for educational uses, are being distributed for educational uses. And what they do with them is, your bus is their business. It's very, very unlikely that you could be blamed um, or found liable. It's, it's hard to even think because you have, to, you have to be telling them to do it and making money. Right? I mean, the standards for secondary liability are actually um, not terribly unreasonable. Um, and so you would have to be saying, you know, you guys should probably look at my slides because I'm really good at picking images, and some of those images would probably make great t-shirts, and I want to nickel it for everyone you sell. <laughs> then you're in trouble. Um, but if you stop short of that, you're probably OK. There's no reason to fret about it. And provide attribution. And provide attribution. And that's something that's in the code. It's in all of the codes. And that's just good practice, right? You want to tell people, for example, if you want to make t-shirts out of this, who do you call to get permission, right? I mean, so it's sort of fundamental and fundamental norm of reasonable use of media is that people need to know the media you used and who, who, where it came from. Now, that may be difficult, right? And it's, you're, if, you're, if you're grabbing things from Google Images that are interesting and there's really no way to attribute responsibly, you know, I think, to, in my mind, the need to teach overcomes the need to be perfect. But, uh, but you should always try very hard to attribute things. So um, if you were using uh, footage from a newscast, mm -hmm. you know, I know that newscasts um, can use a lot of copyrighted information they as do. a newscast. But if you have uh, a newscast on a television set in a scene in your film, um, you know, again, there's no law about this, right? So um, on Creative Cow, which is a, a website for folks who work in films, um, it says, generally, anyone producing a film or documentary intended for commercial release needs to license third-party news footage. So, uh, well, That's I was, false. <laughs> I was going to say, then you would have to, as a producer, 
produce a news segment that you could play on the TV in the back. No, that's so that's absurd. not true, that's, right? That's insane, right? I mean, well, it, it is, but the thing is, is that if it's have, true and, it's and if there's myth. no law, where you know, and and I was going to do this. Well, there is law. I mean, fair use is the law, and there's so good case that's law. Fair use. That is, it would be fair use, right? Okay. If you're, I mean, again, there are you. I would look at the code, yeah. right? But. So it depends on how you use the news footage. Right. But if it's if your documentary is about something newsworthy and you, you need know, the actually, viewer to see that, you know, it was covered on twelve different news broadcasts actually, or whatever. This this question is not for my documentary, this is for my feature narrative film. I see. But the narrative film is about, you know, it, it centers around Iraq, the Iraq war, and so you need to have sort of newscasts that talk That's about an interesting it. thing. I mean yeah. there's again there's there's not a code for narrative film. Right? Yeah, right, and so maybe that's something y'all should think about: is yeah. what's fair in the context. Because narrative film does involve making those choices, right? Yeah. Uh, you know, you're not capturing reality. You know, you're not like at the mercy of the ambiance. You're choosing everything that goes into that film, and yeah. so there, uh, there is at least the beginning of an argument in my mind that you sh that maybe that's right. Maybe you should be paying a license. Well, I'd like to ask you because as an educator, also as a, as a filmmaker and an educator, I'm teaching my students about this, and. And I, I'm not a lawyer, and I don't play one on TV, and I tell them, you know. But what it seems to come down to when they ask me questions is, it depends, I usually say to them, too. And also, are you making money off of it? So in other words, South Park was making money off of that. Right, whereas, but they won. Right. They didn't have to pay that guy, well, that's right? Exactly and that's surprising. something I really want to drive home. It's not, and documentary, well, in theory, documentarians could make money. I mean, they don't, but they could. <laughs> it's only, it's not, it's not for lack of trying, right? <laughs> it's not for lack of trying, and, and I get paid to teach. I don't know about you guys. So it's not about whether somebody's getting paid to do whatever it is they're doing. No, I mean making um, a lot of money. Yes. So in other words, if it's a small documentary. South Park does pretty well. Yeah, that's, what, that, that's when I think that people come after you in court, is if you actually profited off of their copyrighted material, right? Well, and then what's, what's, this is where this stuff about transformativeness gets useful, right? Because the question is, are you profiting off of it um, in the same way that it was meant to be used and anticipated would be used when it was made, right? So. If you're if you're just taking, you know, it's it's just it's common practice to pay for music that is in a narrative film sure. for ambiance, right? Absolutely. People make music, they get deals, you know, that way. It's part of the the you know, it's the ecosystem, and it's an anticipated use. So you're not doing anything new or right. or compelling with the song if you put it in the movie that way. But what, what South Park did, right, was to twist the film. The guy did not make that movie, and nobody makes YouTube movies hoping someone will make fun of it and then that they could get paid for that, right? Nobody gets paid when they get made fun of. Mm -hmm. And so there are these new transformative uses, and they're kind of, they tend to be chunkable into different categories, and that's what these codes do. They say, well, this is a kind of use that's generally fair, and this is a kind of use that's generally fair, these are these are genres of transformative use that are appropriate to the field, and and again, you'd have to ask a narrative filmmaker, in my mind, to learn more about those genres. Right, but then why, do, from what you just said about South Park, why did music sampling then get turned down? Because I think like it's crazy. Doing. They, I They're think they, it. they are. I, it's it's evidence that if you give up too soon and yeah. you don't organize yourself. The system will get away from you, and you will lose your fair use rights. I want to. I've got a couple more but back I don't here. Know if you, oh, sorry. That's right. Let me I'll work my way back. So you first, and then. I wanted to ask about something that may be not quite at the center of your topic, but it's, uh, it's a concern to us because um, it has to do with a, with a long-standing practice where now the arrival of digital uh, the content is making a difference, at least. And, and, and also about this thing about asserting their rights yes. early and often. Um, our library, like libraries all across the country, are investing now heavily in electronic books. And in some cases, it's a lease. And in some cases, it's a purchase. In many cases, it's a purchase. But uh, even if it's a purchase, the, the seller wants to extend <laughs> you know, uh, lingering control over it, they do. such that what they're attempting to do is, is to prevent us from the practice, the long-standing, established, beneficial practice of interlibrary loan, yeah, uh, and you know we've confronted 
uh, sellers have had this many times, and a lot of them just look at us as though, no, that's, that's dead. That doesn't <laughs> <laughs> Why would you need that? And now you can just pay us. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it j just as though back in the print world, if you wanted a book that, you know, so just buy it. Well, it's a problem, just buy yeah. it. So um, it seems to me that the library community is not going to surrender this. <laughs> so they're, I hope you know, not. They're, not, they're not just going to roll over. But having said that, I, I also believe that we're not quite as assertive as we need to be yet, although I was encouraged by uh, some articles I read about an experimental uh, this is Occam's Reader. Yeah. Right now. yeah, yeah, Gwila has a fantastic. Yeah. But what, what is your, uh, do you have an understanding right now of where that yes. situation stands? I do, I do. And you've raised another, I mean, so these are great questions. You guys are, so everything that I might have covered in every other talk I've ever given, you're raising all those good things. So um, this raises a really important topic, which is licensing. And when you've signed something, you know, so you might think you're buying those ebooks, but if you buy those, if you pay for the ebook, and while you're paying for it, you enter into an agreement that says what you can and can't do with the ebook, you're not really buying it, you're licensing it. And the terms of those license, you know, for good or ill, and, and, and I think, you know, practically for ill, but legally, um, I, I, I have a hard time figuring out why this wouldn't be the case. The license trumps fair use. So once you've signed a license, Whatever is in that license is the law between you and that other person. Even if you have a fair use right that would be to the contrary, what you've done by signing the license is surrendered your fair use right. Uh, just like the rights holder has surrendered his copyright, right? He said, I could stop you from, from distributing this book, but I'm signing this piece of paper that says I promise I won't. And when you sign that piece of paper, you're saying, I could interlibrary loan this book, but I'm signing this piece of paper that says I won't. If there's a license term that says you won't, then you're stuck with it. And those are increasing, you know, those are very common licensing terms. And so uh, what I and my colleagues tell everyone that will listen is read those contracts, push back as hard as you can, organize amongst yourselves, um, figure out ways to put pressure on these guys not to try, you know, not not to have these contracts that have you signing away fundamental library functions. I think the Gwila thing is really interesting. So there's a story in the Chronicle Higher Ed. You know, the Greater Western Library Association has created a very simple but very powerful seeming, you know, kind of uh, technology that lets you basically read eBooks on a time limited basis, where it kind of poof disappears at the end of that time. And it's very simple. It works in a browser, so you don't need a special technology to do it. And the publishers are, or Springer anyway, is willing to go forward and try this out. And I think it's that kind of stuff. These guys do, I mean, what they have right now is the power of custody. Like, you can't physically, you can't go steal an ebook. Fair use doesn't let you do that, right? So until you have a, an ebook in your collection, there's nothing you can do. And to get it in your collection, you have to get it from the publisher. And if they won't let you have it unless you sign a contract, they've got that power. And you've got to exercise your own power and bargain with them to get the ebooks into your hands on the terms that you want. Okay. You had a question. I understand why they use vague terms like appropriate, you know, and things like that. But I think that's still something that a lot of faculty and administrators who administrate like online courses and stuff still fear that kind of thing. So you say, I show this feature film in my face-to-face -face class. Now I'm going to teach it online. What's the appropriate amount? The entire film. Absolutely. That's what I show, the entire film. They say, yep. OK, so how are we going to do that? We have to rip a DVD so we can stream it to students. And, and, and a lot of schools will say, I'm not comfortable with that. That sounds like we're doing something wrong. So we're not going to do it. So just don't show the film. Or tell the students, go to Netflix or rent it or something like that. You say, but that's not what face-to-face -face students do. It's not an equal It's not thing. fair. Yeah. Um, and I've taken and taught MOOCs. And I'm in a MOOC right now just as a student that's on the music of the Beatles. Yeah. And it's Coursera, big, big provider, right? University of Rochester, there is no music whatsoever in the course, <laughs> he says this right at the beginning, including if he talks about like a lyrical phrasing or a guitar lick, there's not even 15 seconds. And he says, we don't have the rights to use any of the Beatles music. So we'll tell you what songs and what tracks and timings to go to, but you'll have to do it on your own. 
And I think that fear is still very present out there. Yeah, and, and I'll tell you, the Coursera people, um, you know, I, I'm afraid their approach to this is, the reason that this is happening is that at the very top, and, and certainly not, you know, the people teaching the courses and the librarians supporting them are pushing the way I want them to push, the way they should be pushing for fair use. And they are winning sometimes these battles to include things in courses. But from what I understand, the people at the top of these MOOC architectures would really rather license all that stuff. Um, now, how they're going to pay for that when they don't charge anyone to do their courses is part of the mystery of Silicon Valley, and <laughs> who knows, right? The money, you know, question mark it's equals profit. But redefining what MOOC means because the O of openness in a MOOC is not present in places like Coursera, which none of that is open. You cannot take any of it and reuse it. Yes. You cannot remix it. Yes. They have signature tracks when people pay yes. for it. So it's a completely different model. It's not really even a, mute, a MOOC in the, in the pure form. I so. couldn't agree more. edX, edX is much better, right, in that regard. I mean, and, and I think it's very important. So that's the other side of the coin. I mean, I've, I've talked, um, I, you know, I could talk for a long time about MOOCs. And, and that's the other side of the talk. So part of it is, who owns what goes in, you know, and, and what can go in in terms of fair use? Can you put the Beatles in the class? And then the, the other side of that coin is who owns what comes out and what are the rights in what comes out, right? So does it belong to the professor? Does it belong to the university? And what can the public do with those courses once they have them in their hands? And I'm afraid all those questions are being answered in the wrong ways by some of the people that are doing MOOCs. That's unfortunate. And, and right, the class stinks, doesn't it? I mean, right, that's a terrible way to teach a class. And, and, and no one taking that class is thinking, what a great way to not have to buy any Beatles records. And I'll just, he the class you know. University of Rochester, he plays Of course, of course time. he does, of course he does. I mean, because no one would pay to take that class if there were no <laughs> Beatles songs in it. Um, and let me go in the back here and then I'll come back up to you. Um, you mentioned textbooks are different from other types. Can you elaborate a little bit? I'd love to, uh, because folks sometimes sort of accuse us of, of thinking everything is fair use, and, and really, you know, everything is permitted, right? It's like God is dead, everything is permitted. Um, but in fact, right, I have a paradigm case of what's not permitted, and that is posting, ex posting textbook material to course reserves. I think that's not fair use um, for a very simple reason. There's no way you can, and okay, I'm a lawyer, right? I can think of a counterexample, but in 99.999% of the, of the examples of t using a textbook, it's not gonna be transformative, right? Because the person who wrote it and the person who publishes it were doing this in anticipation of you paying them to use it in a class. And so there's nothing new going on if you scan that book and let tens of thousands of students read the one copy online, right? And so, and, you're, and you really are totally destroying their market. You know, these people will stop making textbooks if no one buys them, unlike, you know, the quote unquote victims of real fair use who have a real business and they're doing fine. Textbook companies would be in serious danger if we started taking their material and distributing it for free. So that's the problem. Now, what's the counterexample to that? If you're, if you're teaching a class about teaching, right? And, and I said, take a look at these three excerpts from a biology textbook, which one teaches the biology concepts you know, most effectively, right? Then you're doing something with the textbook, you're making it an example, and the subject of criticism and commentary that is transformative, right? You're not teaching biology, you're teaching teaching. And so you're not using the textbook in the way that it is written and marketed to be used. And so that's new. Um, but that's an edge case, right? So yes, the, Anne. The other conundrum that sometimes follows is you're talking about textbook with a capital T published by Prentice Hall mm -hmm. with questions at the end of each chapter and an instructor's manual and yep. it's clearly a big fat textbook oh, that costs three hundred dollars. Easy case. To a text that an instructor has chosen to be used in his or her class. Salinger. That's the harder case, right? And, and I think there it's really important to educate the educators. You know, 
have them, you know, expose them to as much information about fair use as you can because ultimately the professors are the ones who are best placed to know how they're using the things that they're using in their classes and whether that use is a transformative use. And to my mind, a lot of those kinds of uses will be transformative, right? So the thing that I think about is um, I had a wonderful class in college on depictions of black men in film, right? And we watched a lot of good movies. We watched some really bad ones. Um, and, and, you know, some were, you know, s some were offensive and some were eye-opening and, and hair-raising and whatever. But, but we didn't watch any of them for their entertainment value, right? We tore them apart. We watched Night of the Living Dead, right? And we didn't talk about, you know, what you normally talk about when you talk about Night of the Living Dead. And so, to my mind, this is as transformative as it gets, right? Or watching Birth of a Nation. You know, you, I should get a medal for watching that. It's hard, very hard to watch. But, but then the reason we watched it, of course, right, was not for the thrilling narrative about the South rising again. It was so that we could talk about how film you know, techniques were used to convey a racist subtext, right, or text in this case. So that's, those, are, those uses of texts are transformative. Some uses are not. Another thing that's interesting to me is that increasingly, right, and I think good teachers teach in a transformative way. Right, so you good teachers want you to encounter a text and not take it on its own terms, but rather bring a critical perspective to the text. Right, and so in the in the good old days, maybe when you read the classics because you should, and you should just learn them and know them, and you sort of you open your head and you pour in all the all the good books, and then you close it. That's not a very transformative undertaking. You're not really bringing much to the table there. And so, yeah, you should pay for the classics the same way anybody does, because all you're doing is consuming them. But I think if you've got a class that's organized around a theme with a critical perspective, then as many, many classes now are, then you've got a, a nice transformative argument on your hands. Yes, and, uh, Sandy, because you. I just wanted to <coughs> differentiate between MOOCs and, uh, you know, online courses because it seems like when they moved to MOOCs all of a sudden they got really scared and said I don't want to use any kind of copyrighted content and uh, it's just because the whole world is watching yes you know versus That's why. an online course but at the same time there I mean there you can make clearly make fair use arguments for usage of materials in the online environment and what strengthens it is password protection, and it's for a course for a limited amount of time for enrolled students, that kind of thing. But right. it's not. So I just, I kind of want to. Can you speak a little bit to the differentiation between MOOCs and and norm, you know, traditional? traditional isn't that funny? Yeah. Now there's a version of online teaching that's traditional. Um, the good old days of online teaching before MOOCs. Um, yeah, I mean, I think I think it's just honestly, it's it's a kind of it's almost an irrational fear of scale. I, I honestly don't think there is a huge distinction. I mean, the only thing is, I suppose, right? There is this question of tailoring your use to your audience, and in the context of a MOOC, it's very hard to know the way that you know a student enrolled at William Patterson University is here for a reason. Hopefully, you know. And they're, and they're doing a certain kind of thing, and you know why they're here, and you know why they're in your class. Somebody on a MOOC could be up to anything, and so perhaps there's a sense of, well, you know, you, you're less secure that the people you're talking to are the people you think you're talking to. But again, as I mentioned earlier in response to the, the question in the back, that's not really your problem. You know, if you're trying, making the best effort to let your audience know what you're doing and why you're doing it, and then you're doing things that are reasonable for those purposes. If your audience is a bunch of scoff laws and they go off and do bad things, I don't think that's your problem. Um, but massiveness freaks people out. Same with Google Books, right? Millions of books is, so, is somehow different than, than hundreds or tens, but really not, right? In, in Google and Hati, the court said, well, I don't really care how many books. What I care is what they did with them. You know, so it was 10 million books, okay, but, but then what happened? Did anybody get to see the books for free? No, nobody gets to read the books, right? I mean, except for the blind, and by God, it's about time, right? And so, 
what matters in the end is what you're doing and not necessarily not necessarily the scale now again there can be kind of overtones and as a as a litigator or a political person you want to think about that judges are not always entirely rational and so you want to think about is your judge going to be is your judge going to fall for this massive you know massiveness is different fallacy um, so, you know, so that's a reasonable calculation to try to make, and I can see the MOOC people, and the MOOC people are also thinking like, I'm on the cover of the New York Times, you know, I just left my university and this is a startup, and, and, it, and I'm telling people I'm going to make money one day, you know, that makes you feel a lot more like a target than, you know, a humble professor teaching a single class on the internet. Yes? Um, this is so basic, I'm almost embarrassed, but um, we have yes. scan two scanners in our library. now. Are we, why, are, are we responsible for how the students use them? No. The no, you're not. <laughs> we don't have to limit their, like, to, the, to a chapter. Or no. no. You don't have to do anything. There's a sign, and the text of the sign is part of the regulations that the Copyright Office proliferates. Um, You've got to put that sign on the machine. As long as you do that, you're fine. And for the reasons I described, right? I mean, students will be students, but, you know, you, have, you, you, you can reasonably assume that they're there to do some research, and, and beyond that, you, it's not your job to be the copyright police. Yes, yes. Um, I found a, a primary source. I look for primary source for my students. In, in any American website, I can't find it, but I found it in a British website. I'm crossing the pond here. <laughs> Uh, does it matter that you're crossing the pond? Um, no, more or less no. Now, I mean, there is a, the deeper answer is, oh God, who knows? Um, because and there is no such thing as international copyright law. Every, every, every copyright law is territorial. The US Copyright Act applies to people in the US. The UK Copyright Act applies to people in the UK. But then what happens if someone in the UK gets upset and wants to sue you because it's their stuff and you, it's as if you came over on a ship, grabbed their stuff, and you, and you took it back to the colonies. Um, what happens if that guy gets mad is a kind of scholarly conundrum um, you know, that could get hairy. But the fundamental principle, and I think this has got to be something that, that is going to be determinative here, even though there's lots of reasons that scholars are concerned about this question, is that territoriality thing. You're in the US. and if anyone wants to sue you, realistically they're suing you in the U.S. and everything you're doing is under U.S. law and so you're acting under fair use. Fair use applies to you. Yes? Um, I'm curious about uh, texts that might be anthologized, for instance stories. Mm -hmm. Lots of textbook companies make money by paying for copyright and anthologizing stories. So mm -hmm. if I took a story that's in a bunch of anthologies and I put that up, uh, scanned it and put it up on my website, that would be perhaps one less anthology that got sold. And my on the other hand, some stories are part of individual collections that are not anthologized and I've inquired as to the copyright about those and the uh, Scribner says no we don't, we're, we're not going to, we're not going to license that story if you want that story, you have to buy that entire book. So I'm sort of curious about the degree to which texts which are not available to be sold can be used behind a pass per, uh, password protected uh, teaching site. Yeah, so one thing that was interesting in the Georgia State case, um, I, I, think, I think the answer is in a way maybe stay tuned. You know, I could, I could I could guess, you know, I, it, would take a, it, it would take a lot of thinking to sort out all the different issues that are going on there. But let me point you at some things that you can watch for and, and, uh, and, and look into. The Georgia State case uh, was very interested, the judge in that case, Arinda Evans, was very interested in whether and how something was available for licensing for use on electric platform, electronic platforms. And so there were several pieces at issue in that case where the publisher, you know, it had admitted in court that the reason, you know, we don't license electronically for people to use excerpts because it is our goal to compel people to buy the print volume. You know, we're afraid we would lose money 
uh, because, uh, you know, which, I mean, it's a confession of being a crummy anthologizer, right? It's like, no one, everything we put together doesn't seem to merit any attention. And so, uh, you know, we're going you know, to force people to buy our crummy anthologies by not letting them pick and choose the parts that are actually worth anything. Um, and the court was actually not very uh, disposed to hear the publishers on that point. So she said, essentially, uh, if you guys aren't on the market with the, exactly what the teachers want, so maybe you've got a print volume, um, but, but if you're not making it available the way the teachers want you to make it available, then I'm not going to hear your arguments about market harm. You, know, you need to be out there giving people the product they want or else you can't say, oh, you know, boo-hoo, they're taking my money. So that was a very interesting outcome, I thought. Um, so watch the appeal, right? Is the appellate court going to agree and take that position? And that I really don't know. Um, but it's a, it's, it's a really interesting issue. The other interesting point is the copyright in an anthology is what we call thin. Um, the anthologist only has the right um, to sort of sue over the infringement of the, the collection as a whole, right? So if I put together an anthology that's sort of, you know, Eng the English lit greatest hits 1900 to today, and uh, it's got a little bit from, you know, from the Brontes or whatever, and you put, a little, you put that same little bit on your website, I don't have a cause of action against you. The only right I have is in the whole thing because that all that I've done is the only thing I've added to the world is my selection and organization of the anthology. And so my copyright is in that anthology and how it's organized and what's in it, but not any one thing that's in there. Now, whoever owns the copyright in the Bronte essay could then come after you, but the anthologizer cannot. I guess one of the things I'm saying, though, is that there are short stories that are part of single author collections that are not anthologized. Right, right. Right, and again, I, I think Georgia State, you know, Judge Evans would say, um, if you need that story and no one will sell it to you, then that helps you on the fair use front, right? Um, but I know some copyright lawyers, especially ones who work for publishers, who would disagree, right? And so I'm not, I can't tell you there's sort of an established answer for that question, but I can tell you there's interesting trend lines in the court. Way back. I want to ask the, uh, the flip side of the, of the situation. Uh, nowadays, we use like recording tools to record our lectures in the classroom and then post it on the web so that you can see it, get it from home, or re revise or review it. And let's say one of those files got onto the web and then just went viral. It's like mm -hmm. some what a nightmare. Like others may be apprehensive of that. Like, I'd like to stop that. Yeah. And then the server actually has that. But I like to fair use. Uh, I like to use the, the fair use uh, to write it. So I don't think I like to take it down. Then how do we approach it? Well, uh, there are, there are a few layers to that onion. And one is who really owns that lecture that was recorded? I bet it's not you. I bet it's your university, because um, it's what it's 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 a work made for hire. It's something that you did on the job in the capacity, in your capacity as a teacher. And so, and especially if it's the university doing the recording, I'm guessing it belongs to the university. Now there might be, different universities have different understandings with their faculty, so some universities sort of generously say, we'll let you own your, your syllabi or your recorded lectures. Um, but that's a kind of, it varies from school to school. So that's an interesting preliminary question, right, is if you don't like it, do you even have a right to assert? Maybe it's only the university that could be upset. Um, but then, you know, I, I, the, the bottom line question would be, right, so who's the rights holder? And then, of course, you would, have, you would certainly have the right to ask, for example, YouTube to take that down, right? Um, because if they're posting the entire video, uh, I, it's hard to see how that would be transformative, right? They're, and maybe they could mix, remix you, right? And they could, you know, you could, they could have you recite the Gettysburg Address by cutting it up. But, uh, yeah, but if they don't do that, you know, unless they do something like that, then you've got a really easy uh, takedown uh, ask. And, and, all you, and, and this is another part of the Copyright Act, the notice and takedown provisions, that basically allow anyone who is a rights holder um, to ask any, any platform like YouTube to just take something down. And, and YouTube has to do it. 
And so that would make it. And, and most people, when confronted by a takedown, uh, don't, put any, don't put the thing back up. They just walk away. They don't fight, uh, that is. They may put it back up under some new account, but nobody says, how dare you? This is fair use. Generally, people are scared, and they go do something else. Anything else? Shockingly, I'm not hungry, so yeah, I can talk yeah, as long I, as people want well, to. I, it's, it's actually after 2 o'clock. Okay. So, um, I want to thank everybody for uh, coming, and I especially want to thank you, Brandon Butler, for my, joining us. Too. My pleasure.